When I think of Game Freak, I think of Pokemon. I feel this is going to be the case for many people who hear that company name. I'd wager a bet and say that a good portion of you out there wouldn't be able to name some of Game Freak's other titles if I put you on the spot. Some of those being Drill Dozer, Pulse Man, and everyone's favourite Vore icon, Yoshi. And honestly, with Pokemon's gargantuan shadow, how can I blame you? And by the looks of it, Game Freak probably understand that their team might be getting burnt out like the funny orange lizard in episode 11. I, I'll call him Hamilton. Thus did the Gear Project initiative begin, something which the company was apparently prioritising over their Pokemon games, allowing creators to present their original ideas. And if these ideas are well received, they're given a budget and are allowed to take a shot at creating this game. The desired result of this initiative is to rejuvenate and refresh these creators before they're slung back into the Pokemon machine, gaining experience as they do so. This has already borne fruit over the years, but I I can't remember any of them getting the spotlight. This is something which Little Town Hero, the latest Gear Project title to be birthed onto the Nintendo Switch, actually succeeded in doing. Getting a pretty tasty little spot during a Nintendo Direct, and making sure to advertise the fact that the man himself, Toby Fox from Undertale fame, would be composing the soundtrack. Well, after this initial announcement, news on Little Town Hero went quiet, and it released with a fanfare of excitement. Now, because of the social media wildfire that has been blazing over the past few months in regards to Game Freak's creative choices in Pokemon Sword and Shield, a flame that will be tough to extinguish on both sides, I've been keeping a close eye on news surrounding the company, which is why I became one in a dozen that actually remembered this game was releasing. I bought it for the low launch price of approximately £25 and decided to give this title a damn good shot. My verdict? didn't like it. But, 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 I don't like to shit on a game without showcasing the good, and this game thankfully does have good qualities, even if some of those qualities are simply the concepts that the game presents to you. So let's crack this bad boy open, shall we? Also, I'm super close to 100k, so please subscribe if you enjoy my content. Okay, thank you. It's been a cheeky boy. Little Town Hero focuses on a young boy called Axe, a miner who lives in a little town which is surrounded by mountains. Everyone who lives here isn't allowed to leave into the outside world because the bureaucracy says so, and despite sounding like a fucking nightmare scenario, everyone seems to be okay with that. But of course, Axe, being a damn youth, he wants to go out and fetch those Pokemon creatures and escape the clutches of Boomer Barry over here. You want me to name an animal like that? Are you crazy? But it looks like his town needs him more than his lust for adventure, as monsters have started to periodically appear, threatening the peaceful lives these civilians lead. So, let's talk about the positives first. A burger needs a bun, after all. For those of you wondering if Toby Fox, with Hitomi Sato arranging his compositions, have succeeded in creating a good selection of music, I would have to say they delivered. The man just has a way with music, and I'm so happy to see that Undertale's success had led to some other business opportunities. Whilst I'd argue that the majority of Little Town Heroes OST isn't as memorable as Undertale's or even Deltarune's, there are a couple of bangers hidden away in here that I play whilst I'm doing in the washing up, feet tip tapping away. Having dynamic music was such a nice touch as you walk around the town. The instruments will change as you walk from neighborhood, farm, and shopping districts, and it honestly made the world seem a little more active. The monster designs are overall pretty kick-ass. Each one is totally unique, and even when they reuse a model, they tweak it in a way where it still feels like a brand new element. There's creativity here, and whoever designed them clearly had a fun time creating interesting creatures for us to fight. And by the looks of it, the developers put a lot of effort into polishing these beasties up the most. Another thing I can appreciate with the monsters, yet again, brings me back to the soundtrack, where each one has its own theme tune. There isn't a standard battle theme in Little Town Hero. Each monster has its own track. Well, holy moly, screams little Timmy from the audience. There must be quite a few tracks on the album then. Oh dear Timmy.
me, my sweet little urchin child. We will get back to that. There are some cute moments in the story here or there. I found myself getting momentarily attached to some of the cast, and the way they integrate them into the battle system definitely makes you favor some over the others. An optional boss! I love it when games do this. I was honestly shocked they would include one, but here it is. And finally, yes, the list really is that short, I'm so sorry. The battle system was a very interesting idea. I felt the concept of the battle system was honestly pretty brilliant. And I'm not joking here, I'd love to see them learn from their mistakes and maybe bring it back for a Pokemon spin-off or another title altogether. Sadly, that's all I like. The concept. The execution is a whole other conversation. Now we must watch him strangle to death. And we'll be having that father-child chat very soon, don't you worry. So now we move on to, I, I guess, the rest of the video, where I try my best to explain why I won't be touching this game again unless I need more footage to show my therapist. So I know I bring up the budget a lot, and I'll admit I'm talking from a place of ignorance here. I'm willing to admit that it could be the mismanagement of funds, but there are so many little details that are missing from the final game that are pushing me to believe that whatever they were given just wasn't enough, especially considering how Sword and Shield were being developed at the same time. Which does bring the whole focusing on original content ahead of Pokemon line to feel a little bit sketch if my theory is indeed true. I'll believe that's what they'd like to do, but considering how Pokemon brings in the major bread, a company's gotta do what a company's gotta do, end of the day. You can't feed a starving family with dust, I understand. Now, gameplay in Little Town Hero is, as I said, a conceptually good idea. The best way I can describe it to someone is a mashup between Magic the Gathering Arena and Hearthstone style games and Mario Party. During a fight, you have your selection of techniques and the enemy has theirs. We'll call them cards for the sake of ease. And now... And it's your job to make sure your cards have more attack than the enemy's cards defense, until you whittle them down enough to attack the enemy's hearts. That is the extremely simplified version of the gameplay, because it goes surprisingly in depth and can be a tad frustrating for a game that, from the outside looking in, looks like it was made for children. You know, Little Town Hero, where your silly friend gets his bum bum set on fire and you run away from the mean doggy. So, in Little Town Hero, you fight with ideas. Ideas are cooked up in your headspace, which is essentially your card deck. When an idea is put into your hand, which surrounds acts in a little circle, they are known as is-its. Uh -huh. And as you fight, you gradually gain power, which can allow you to select stronger ideas and turn the is-its into deserts. So, Izzets are ideas which haven't been turned into a Dazit, but you can only turn an Izzet into a Dazit when you have enough power. And you can refresh your headspace with BP, which is only gained when you successfully break an opponent's total hand with your Dazits. But we aren't done yet. You see, there are three types of Izzets. Red, yellow, and blue. Once turned into Dazits, they do different things. Using a red Dazit will do a simple attack, but will be unusable for the rest of the turn. A yellow Dazit serves as a defense mechanism where you can use it as much as you want during a turn until its defense is broken. And a blue Dazit serves as a spell card, where it'll either give you random buffs, damage techniques, or give you a new card from your headspace. Your enemy's deck is unlimited and doesn't share the same red, yellow, and blue Dazit mechanism, which definitely makes things interesting. Essentially, this means that each battle revolves around you trying to preserve your deck for as long as possible so you don't run out and are forced to struggle, which allows the enemy to take a direct hit at your health. But oh what are these delicious looking walkers squares covering your hearts? Square. Crisp. These are effectively barrier points which protect your hearts from taking direct damage. And you can only hit them with a certain type of card or if you've broken your enemy's hand. And that's not taking into account the way you move around the town whilst battling. And here's where Super Mario comes into things. <laughs> In a Mario Party type fashion, you roll a dice and you and the enemy are taken to whatever square you land on. There's a chance these squares can either hold a gimmick or a town member. A gimmick can only be activated with specific red is -its. Which is a dazit. <laughs> 
Love me. And can do a variety of useful effects, and townsfolk are essentially gimmicks without needing to activate a goddamn spell card. Oh, hang on, fucking Jesus Christ. I forgot to mention that you can only attack your enemy's hearts so long as a red is it has been turned into a desert and hasn't been used on your turn. Right, did I miss anything else? Oh, the enemy attacking your hearts refills your deck. Okay, I'm ready to drop a big stress-induced poo-poo in the toilet now, ladies and gentlemen. Now please keep in mind, this is a game which the director claims is made for the busy gamer, making it so you don't grind for experience, and even when you lose, the game is very generous, and will grant you skill points so you can power up your deck or your shield. This is honestly fine, and the skill points were welcomed with open arms, because considering how battles can last up to 30 minutes to an hour at times, the final boss, and oh my god we'll get to that disaster of a final boss, lasting up to an hour and a half for me, I welcome being stronger on my next round. This is why the OST is relatively short. There are barely any fights at all, because your fights last for so goddamn long. That's not to say that all of the matches are this lengthy, so long as the RNG is in your favour. And yes, of course there's RNG, because this is a Mario Party card game. Your hand is random, as is the next card that's given to you unless you spend your slowly earned BP to get a good card, and that BP doubles if you want to do it again. Again. And your map positions are also random, which can sometimes completely fuck you up as the battle is nearing its finale, which golly sure made me an angry little toddler, I can tell you that for sure. Made for a busy gamer is a quote which gets under my skin as well. Because as I said, from the outside looking in, this looks like a game which was made for young kids. And if you're referring to them as busy gamers because of their school schedule, I was a kid once. And you want to know what I did? I got home from school, played a few hours of my JRPG, then picked it back up when I got back from school the next day. I'm sorry, but I can't see an office worker with little time to pick up and play a game to rush to the Nintendo eShop to pick up Little Town Hero. There are tonal issues here, and honestly with the awful naming conventions, I can see them confusing both an office worker and child. With the ears, it's in the dads, it's in the- If you're trying to get a friend into the game, I can't imagine you'd explain it in the same way the game tries to. You'd simplify things. Red ideas, yellow ideas, blue ideas. You awaken them so you can use them. Done. Thank you! Whenever something like this crops up, I'm always brought back to Peril of Pokey's fantastic Final Fantasy XIII video where he talks about the same thing. Or maybe they could have named these esoteric lifeforms, some of which I didn't realize were lifeforms until tens of hours into the game, by using descriptive words. Fuck Valsi, that shit's a demigod. Instead of, let's see, why not, cursed? Seath? No, they're clearly the fallen or the failed? Ah, oh, right, Seath stones. I almost forgot about them. Forgotten. I'm going for the forgotten. My final issue with the battle system brings back our old friend the budget, and this is where it really begins to show. The fact that fights last so long means you'll be staring at this battle screen for a lengthy amount of time, so you'd expect them to make things a little flashy in order to entertain your squirrel brain before the game crashes, and I'm forced to exit and stare longingly at a much better game I could be playing right now, which by the way you should totally go and buy. The Switch version adds a whole bunch of new content and the sprite mode is an incredible feat to put alongside the original game. Oh look, a squirrel. What we get in place of a nice collection of unique battle animations are five battle animations. One for red, one for yellow, one for blue, one for attacking hearts, and one for winning the fight. You have a variety of different ideas to use, which each have their own unique art on the front. But when it comes to performing it, you do the exact same attack animation depending on its color rather than its implied action. And then of course there are your heart attacking finishers that remain the same from from start to finish. Which made me laugh pretty hard when during the sheep shearing mission, the animation for shearing is to jump in midair and cover the little fucker in liquid hot magma, but hey it seems to do the trick. Calm the dog down, magma. Tell the kitty off, magma. Fight your rival for the 18th goddamn time? Magma. The problem with this is when you're stuck watching the same thing over and over again, it gets tiresome. You get visually bored. Or at least I did. Insanity is repeating the same thing over and over. We truly live in a society, people. The whole game just reeks of cheapness. From the visuals, to the animations, and even 
the script itself. The story, like the gameplay, has a fragment of promise. I got briefly reminded of Dark Cloud 2's premise at the start, and the idea of an entire story being set in the town rather than going out on a big grandiose trip was a cute, quaint idea. This is Little Town Hero after all, not Little Adventure on the Prairie. The problems I have are the fact that the story subverted my expectations by being far too basic, and even the memorable parts are just spoiled by ending far too suddenly. For example, Spoilers if you worry about that stuff, 3, 2, 1. You go back in time via time travel nonsense and meet your dad who had been missing for 15 years after your birth. He teleports back to you in the future, not realizing how much time has passed. Is reintroduced to his now smoking hot milf wife, but this miserable goblin is like no Christmas cake for you, sunshine, and smacks him so hard he dies in a single frame. May hot single mothers be looking for you in the afterlife, my friend. You also get a cool monster form right before the final boss, but do you get to use it? Is is this chaos from Dirge of Cerberus all over again? Guess I have no choice. <laughs> No, of course you don't. You think they can afford a new battle mechanic and skin when they can't even animate your dad dying a sad, milfless death? I don't think so, Buster Brown. And speaking of the final boss, let's get into it. Let's get into one of the single most annoying final bosses I've ever had the displeasure of fighting. I want you to keep in mind everything I've said about the gameplay. How the opponent's deck is used to make sure your deck is empty, forcing you to struggle, and how you're meant to take down your enemy's shield in order to attack their hearts. Thing is, is that the final boss has infinite shield. Fair enough, I was guessing that the townsfolk would cheer the hero on, breaking the shield in a power of friendship undertale finale kind of way. If only it were that simple, my friends. No, the only way to break this infinite shield is to land on each townsfolk on the map using your random dice throw where they, one by one, gradually begin to shatter the shield. You cannot damage it in any way during this fight until the town's members have helped you shatter the shield. Now, blessedly, there are cards which allow you to move freely around the map for four spaces, depending on certain circumstances. So using the is so good at points. But again, due to the RNG factor, it's entirely possible that the card will be destroyed on the next turn, or the space where a town's member is located is maybe five or six spaces away. But here comes the worst of it, where I was so done with the game that I had to get up and pace around my office. There are three phases of this fight. Your deck is not refreshed, your health remains the same, and you still have to randomly land on three of the townsfolk in order to break its infinite shield. This means that if you didn't do well in round one due to the RNG factor, you'll just have to hope and pray that your second attempt goes much smoother. Just listen to how manic I was a few minutes after I beat the boss. So you have to go around the map! <laughs> you have to go around the map! <laughs> you have to go over it again! You have to go over it again! and land on three town members to break the fucking shield! Now I have to throw out some positives here to make this coffee less bitter, but this finale track by Toby Fox is, oh my god, it is so, so good. It's a somber remix of the game's main theme, but once you're on that final phase winning streak, it erupts into a euphoric burst of energy, mixing the main theme with the kids theme, and it actually makes me care about beating this stupid boss, and makes me care about these characters even for a moment because they're all here to stop the final boss as a family. <laughs> but then you stop for a moment, and you realize how hard Toby's music was carrying this entire fight. And in fact, how hard Toby's inclusion as the composer affected people's interest in this game. And doesn't it say something when the fight is so long and so frustrating that I had to mute my TV? Because if the best song in the world was looping every three or four minutes for an hour and a half, I'd get sick of it. And in the end, sadly, after beating the boss and the town was saved, I felt nothing but exhaustion. Considering how we're now at the end of the video, I really don't want to end it with a bad taste in my mouth. Something I've been trying very hard to do lately is to find praise in something I just do not enjoy. Oh, how can I stay mad at you? 
And the most positive thing about this whole project, outside of a composition, is the gear project itself. I think this is a genuinely amazing idea, and that Game Freak should be praised for giving their team the chance to make something original, gaining experience and reducing chances of the all too common game industry burnout. But I think the timing of this one was all off. Sword and Shield's development must have had an impact on how much these developers were given, and all I can wonder is how it might have turned out if they just waited for the supposed quiet time in between their larger projects. Getting angry at Game Freak for at least trying to move out of Pokemon Shadow isn't it. In fact, I wholeheartedly support the Gear Project, and I'll be keeping a cautious eye open at whatever the initiative pumps out next. Game Freak are not free of criticism. I do it a lot on my social media, and I've made a video doing the same thing. But I won't hang my head in disgust at the idea of them at least attempting to innovate and create something unique, even if it didn't work out in the end. I think the most disappointing thing about this game is not the fact that it's just a bad game, it's the fact that you can see a lot of charm and potential here that was unfortunately being held back and never had a proper chance to grow. But until we get another banger out of the Gear Project, I'll be sat patiently over here catching Pokemon creatures as Boomer Barry wipes a dusty tear from his dry, cracked cheek. Alright, and that's the end of that. Feel this is the first video in a long time where I couldn't recommend something. Feels weird. If you really liked this video, then please head on over to my Patreon, which can be found down below. The names scrolling by on the right are the lovely people who are already helping me create content. Any extra help will be greatly appreciated. Thank you if you can, but if not, then a subscription is more than enough. And looky looky here, another great selfie drawing in the style of Ken Sugimori. Her page is found down below, so be sure to commission her if you like what you see. Hope you're all alright and are excited for the next video and podcast, and I'll see you all next time.